Hello and welcome to another Be Your Own Loud podcast presented by us here at Proud Mouth. I'm Matt Halloran, your host. This show has a very simple foundation to meet amazing people who have risen above the noise, who are unapologetically themselves and have embodied being their own loud. Using these interviews as inspiration, our purpose is to help you amplify your voice to become the subject matter authority you were meant to be. Be Your Own Loud. Hello and welcome to another Be Your Own Loud podcast. I'm your host, Matt Halloran. You're in for a doozy today. We have an NFL Super Bowl champion, a person who not only has achieved unbelievable amounts of success, but has worked for his whole life on how to help people just like you achieve unbelievable level of success by understanding how your mind works and where you go from there. So I want to welcome uh, Chucky Okobi, again, Super Bowl champion, TEDx speaker, and the man who's going to help you get out of your own way. Chucky, welcome to the show. Well, I appreciate you having me. Talking about these things, this is my passion, so it's going to be fun. Well, let's talk about your story. Why don't you give everybody just a a brief understanding of who you are and, and why you're here? Well, I'm just my mother's son. Everything after birth, just just details. So, you know, the big thing is growing up, lived in a household that was there was a lot of tension a lot of drama things that just ra- i would rather not deal with so at a very young age i was always looking to get out the house you know i was that kid that came home took off his school clothes changed and was right back outside and so sports would became the outlet to deal with the emotions and some of the doubts about life i mean at a very young age i just got here i'm seven years old i don't what do i know but i'm already dealing with all this craziness so sports really spoke to me because, you know, not really feeling valued and feeling by society, not really feeling valued in my own home, at least when I was playing sports, when I was out with my brother and we we're playing with kids in the neighborhood, we we're playing baseball, we we're playing football, we we're playing basketball. I was pretty good. And so sports became the place where I felt self-worth. It wasn't the, the pomp and circumstance you see on television. That's, that's your stories as the fan. To me, this was my way of making meaning out of a life that at a very young age had no meaning. I grew up in neighborhoods and, you know, I went to schools early on in life where I was the only black kid in class. And this isn't about race so much as just not feeling like you found a tribe where you fit in. And even when I was around other kids, as I moved around, when I got older, it was around inner city black kids. But my parents, I'm first generation American. My parents are African. I grew up in an African culture, in an African house. So you got to understand deep down as a child, I didn't like myself. Yeah. Everywhere I looked around, I was different. I was, I was a little fat kid who's, you know, super dark, you know, the only black kid in class a lot of times. But it's when I was playing sports, <laughs> I liked myself and everyone seemed to like me. So this was a very spiritual and emotional journey. A lot of times people just think of, you know, ESPN and whatnot. And there's definitely an element of that to it, playing Big Ten football for five years and playing in the NFL for eight years. Yeah, I got all those stories, too. But you never think most people don't think about the person that I never played football until I was 13 years old. And, you know, what led me to choose that path? And it was literally a spiritual and emotional journey to self-worth and finding meaning for my life. And I found it. Something that we talked about uh, on a previous show was uh, we had a gentleman on the show. His name is Jerome Myers, and he calls himself Morpheus because he asks you if you're going to take the red pill or the blue pill to exit or enter in or stay in the matrix. And you and I had a a wonderful sort of movie reference, too. And this is the foundation that I want to start off with today, which is you say that there is no wizard in in, in referencing the Wizard of Oz. What do you mean by that? Well, the biggest thing is. Most of us are walking around telling ourselves a story about ourselves, about what our life is like, and whether it sucks or it's heaven on earth, about our capabilities of getting over something, how to get over in what seem to be insurmountable challenges. But you got to remember, you got to remember Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. Now, when she first got into Oz, right, she found herself in a crisis. All of a sudden, everything's in vivid color. Yeah. She's surrounded by all these little people it's like you know ladies know what i'm talking about it's like that dream where there's nobody to dance with because they're all so short and so dorothy's going crazy like what is this all about there's this lady 
why does she look like that? And what is her attitude is not working for me. I just want to go home. I, I just want to go home. I just want to go back to Kansas. Believing she herself didn't have the ability to get the results she wanted. She started asking everyone else. It's kind of like people going to Facebook now. Well, what should I do? Where should I go? Who can save me? Well, follow the other brick road. Go see the wizard. If there's anybody out here who has what you need, this is the guy. Anything you want, he can help you get it. But thinking to herself, well, I don't have, I can't do it. I can't. I'm not good enough. So I have to go find the wizard. So she heads down the yellow brick road. On that journey, we met those three characters, right? Mm -hmm. The first one didn't think he was smart enough. The second one didn't think he was tough enough. He didn't have a heart. The third one didn't think he was smart enough. And with this thinking, they head down the yellow brick road, overcoming all kinds of obstacles to get to the solution, this presumed solution, the wizard. Mm -hmm. I mean, the trees came alive, flying monkeys, all kinds of stuff. And she got past it. Yep. She she got past it without the wizard. Only to find out what? There's no wizard. There's no wizard. There's no wizard. Dorothy, if you want out of this crisis that you find yourself in, it's on you. It's on you. You want to go home? You're going to have to figure out a way to make that happen. And so Dorothy's sitting there thinking, why does that have to be so hard? Why am I stuck in this situation? You know what? I'm going to marry one of these little people who have little, you know, little people, babies. And I guess that's my life now. Yeah. But you got to think back to the beginning with that green faced lady. Why was she acting like that? And why was her focus on the shoes? Because you recognize Dorothy had those shoes the whole way down the yellow brick road. Yeah. yeah. Right. What she didn't have was the basic instructions of how it works. So let's and talk she, basic instructions. I mean, that's that's where we got to go right here because I think people are listening, and they're you're talking about a substantial amount of empowerment. But the biggest issue that ninety nine point nine percent of us have is that we don't have the instructions to get out of our own way. What the hell are the instructions, and how do you help people get out of their own way? Well, the biggest thing is understanding that the way to change the way you're experiencing life, the way to change your results is whatever you are doing to get those results, whatever you believe is the cause of those results, you got to put all, all that to the side. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And as our head coach, when I was on the Steelers, who I'm actually heading to the Hall of Fame this weekend to see him inducted, you don't know what you don't know, and it's what you don't know that you don't know that's running the show. And if you knew, it's like, if I believe that I can't, if I believe that I'm not, then that's what you're going to experience because that's the story you're telling yourself in there. So think about that self-talk. What, what story am I telling myself as I go about my life, as I go about building my business, as I go about building my family? What is the story? Am I constantly saying, oh, I don't want to do this? Think about that. Is that what you're thinking? Because it all comes down to the mind, body, energy connection or emotional connection. And most people don't recognize that there's nobody else in your mind but you. So if you're having mental issues, who do you expect to fix it? The wizard that doesn't exist? You're the only one in there. You are the narrator of your life. And so all the, the things that have happened in your life experience that have led to this story that you have about yourself, about your circumstance, about your life, you got to question it. All right. You got a question. You, you just, I, I have to challenge you on this because so many people will say that I'm not the only person in there. There's these tapes that are running. There are other people's voices, other people's advice that I'm really clinging on to. How does one get those tapes under control and realize, realize that it's actually you, it's not the tapes. Help, help us with that. Please. You are the DJ. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You are good. Your mom is not in your mind. She is in Florida at whatever the village is enjoying the rest of her life. She's not in there. That voice is a, a recording that you're keeping. The bottom line is, Matt, if you don't take 100% accountability that you are the cause of whatever you're experiencing because your emotions are where they're in here, your thoughts are where in here and nobody else is. So if you don't, the first thing before we even get into how you get rid of those tapes, because I'll tell you exactly how to get rid of that. 
But before that, if you don't take responsibility for your life experience, nobody can help you. Nobody. That's why you end up in therapy for years and years and years and years and years because you're waiting for the wizard to go bing and fix you. And it's not going to happen. To me, everything we do and even clinicians that I work with, working, doing nonprofit mental health work and working with just clinicians that I know, most people don't realize this is a do with process. They can't jump in your head and change anything, but Mm -hmm. they can give you guidance as to how you can do it. And if you don't do it, you're going to suffer until you die. And that's what's going to happen. I'm telling you, and it's that extreme. It is that extreme. If you believe you know that, that life sucks, then life will suck until the end because you said so. So that's step one. That's the biggest step. How are you going to shake people and make them understand or give them the tools to take 100% responsibility? Because it sounds to me that if I can't do that, Chucky, the rest of the basic instructions aren't going to be as is beneficial to me. Fair? Yeah, yeah, it's fair. The biggest thing, basic instruction number one is let go of the past. That means let go of any any events in the past that are, that when you think of them now, that they still hurt. That tells you you got a problem okay. because it's not happening right now. But a lot of it's understanding the conscious mind and the unconscious mind dynamic. The biggest thing is I can't make somebody want to take responsibility because what we have in this in this world that is a total travesty to me, this is the real pandemic, is what I call victim consciousness. I'm always aware of how things are unfair. I'm always aware about how things happen to me. Most people never come out and, and acknowledge their role that they played in whatever circumstance they're, they're in. And you know the easiest example? When I was a kid, my favorite sport was baseball. From Pittsburgh, I wanted to play pro sports, but truth be told, I wanted to play baseball. Mm-hmm. I just I just failed miserably at that and fell back on football. But the thing is, Anytime I remember, you know, baseball, they play all the time. So Mm -hmm. I just remember like going to school and be like, did you see the pirate game last night? People are like, yeah. Well, what happened? Oh, we won. We won. We won. Mm -hmm. Next day you come in. So what happened? They lost. (laughs) And you see, like, this this is is life and death important. Yeah. Because people don't realize that they have a habit of, separating themselves from anything they feel is negative. And so that, because if they lost, that that presupposes, it's, I had nothing to do with it. That's right. But the thing is, when they win, now you want to be part of it. We won. No, you can't have it both ways. Yep. If we won, then we lost. If they lost, then they won. Which one is it? Because the way you see the world, anytime it's something negative, you got a story to explain yourself out of responsibility. And that's why you're suffering because they, people don't understand emotions. And this is where the rubber really reads the road is people do not understand emotions. They don't understand how we store emotions over time. So because they don't know that they're stored in there because it's in the unconscious or some people will call it the subconscious, they don't know it's there. So they're not taking any action to remove it. I don't know. There's a problem. How would I solve it? Mm -hmm. You don't know what you don't know. But here's the thing. There's no such thing as good and bad emotions. There's positive and there's negative. So what happens is what people will think the negative emotions because they don't feel so good is something to avoid. But that's the biggest mistake. Okay. Because- elaborate on that. Uh, no, uh, that you, the, you open that up, man. I got, we got to dive down that whole, whole more deep. We can go real deep into that one. I'm I'm hearing what you're saying, I think, which is since it is negative, then I am a, a subscribing or ascribing to it that it is is unpleasant, therefore not good, therefore I don't want to deal with it. Mm. But if you but if you did deal with it, where you can go in places that you couldn't if you didn't, if you try to avoid it. How in your life, let's pause for a moment. I am mm-hmm. assuming that there were lots of times where you had negative emotions or oh, negative yeah. surrounding stuff. What did you do to do what you needed to do to push those aside, deal with them, get them out of your way, or confront them head on so that you were able to take it to the level that you got, Chucky? It, it, the first thing was I made a decision that what I was experiencing was unacceptable. It's unacceptable. You got to make the decision that I will change or I will die. 
that this living life like this, it's unacceptable. It hurts. I don't like it. I don't like feeling fear. I don't like feeling anxiety. I don't like feeling sadness. And so the first thing you have to do is instead of saying, whoa, me, I have depression, I have anxiety. First of all, say, you know what? This feeling sucks and it's unacceptable. I don't know exactly how I'm going to get rid of it, but I am. And then that starts a search. There's somebody else out there has been through what you've been through and they found a solution. So to me, it all started when I was at Purdue. Okay. And I only got one scholarship offer coming out of high school. And that was from Jim Coletto. And he gave me a scholarship back in 96 to play at Purdue. But after my first year where I redshirted, he resigned. And my belief was that nobody else wanted me. And you can see how it would come to that conclusion. Totally. And I freaked out. Like PTSD flipped out, thought I was going to die because this was what, this is where my life was going. Sports is what I needed at that time, 18 years old. That was my self-worth. And I was scared. And I made the decision that this feeling and this story I have of failure in my mind, no, that's not going to happen. And that's where it started. And so I decided I need to go and find some sort of solution to deal with this problem. I went to a used bookstore on campus and I found a book by Dr. Tad James. And the name of the book is, and it's out of print, so anyone who goes to look for it, you're not going to find it. But the name of the book is The Secret to Creating Your Future. Mm-hmm. And most people don't know Tad James was the first certified master trainer of neuro linguistic programming. Oh, so this is back in '96. I found it. The book was from 1986, but I found something in a used bookstore. So I was looking in the trash, and I believe nobody else, my competitors, my teammates, the other people in the Big Ten, Ohio State, Michigan, and Wisconsin, they didn't know this. That was my thinking. So I took and I just dived into it to learn how to control this because I don't remember him saying this specifically in the book or if this is just my deductive reasoning as an 18 year old, but the whole thing was with all the things he was talking about with NLP timeline therapy, all these different things that are out there still today, mm-hmm. even, even growing. He's like, you can control what's in your mind. You can learn to do it. And so I was like, wow. And if I learn this stuff, I can create my future. Yeah. And it's the title of the book. So it was, but it was, the big thing was your whole world is actually in your mind. It's simply just compiled sensory information, things you heard, things you saw, things you felt emotionally or kinesthetically, things you tasted, things you, you smelled. That's all your whole world is. That's the only way we can make sense of what's going on outside of our bodies. So the, the whole notion that my entire world is in my mind and with this NLP mind mastery stuff he's talking about, you telling me I can control what's going on in my mind. So at, at 18 years old, I just came to the conclusion, well, if I can control what's in my mind, then I can control my world. And I don't have to feel like this. And I made a commitment to myself that I was going to learn to control my world. That's that- not normal. Hold on. That's not a normal thing for an 18 year old to do. Uh, where, how, I mean, really, you have to, I, I, I don't agree with that. You I don't, because, I then- don't agree with, I, 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 categorically disagree with that nice. and what it is so so what people do is they make a decision they can't they make it they everyone makes a decision mm-hmm. the question is do you give in to that feeling mm. of fear and anxiety and make your decision you can't or do you make a decision that's unacceptable i simply said no i'm not depressed i'm not i don't have anxiety i'm going i'm going somewhere this is who i'm meant to be i've known this since i was seven years old and now I got to figure out how to get there. So like I live in Kansas city. Okay. If I drive down 70 and I'm going to Denver straight shot, you don't have to get off the highway at all. So from Kansas city to Denver and I get to that Kansas, Colorado border and the road is closed. Does that mean I can't get to Denver? It does not. No, it doesn't. But that's what people do in their minds. And that's when that is the thing is everybody makes a decision and you're in charge of that decision, not COVID, not whoever's in the White House, not your ex, not the government. You, you made the decision as to what is true. And that's what Jerome's talking about, is you need to be able to, to decipher what you're experiencing instead of just being plugged into the matrix and be, having to accept whatever comes your way. I simply said, no. When I had, I had the negative stories, I had the negative feelings, and I said, no, that's it. Is that that without that, no therapist, nobody, Sigmund Freud himself couldn't help you if you decide you can't. 
Yeah. All <laughs> That's right. the truth. Well, so you don't know what you don't know. You said that early on in the show. One yeah. of the issues that you and I talked about previously is that is that people don't have room in their cup because they think they know, and in fact, they don't. And you can't continue to fill up your cup, the self-improvement, self-awareness, self-understanding, being really truly who you are and what you want to be when you grow up, until you empty the cup. How do you help people dump some of that crap out and give it so that they can put some more good stuff in that cup? The biggest thing is all the stuff that's filled up our cups. I want to get deeper into that in a second. The biggest thing is understanding what is my cup full of. Nice. You know, so that's that's a big thing. Most people don't know. They think the way they're seeing things is reality, but it's simply their interpretation. And so, you know, if somebody if, if a client comes to me and says, "Oh, you know, life, life sucks," I can't answer. I can't really argue that because I'm not in their head. I've never felt their joy. I've never felt their pain. Sure. And so it's about people understanding what pain is, what negative emotions are. See, the thing is, people, again, they think negative emotions are bad. There's no, every emotion is good. Every emotion is a gift. Mm. There's no such thing as bad. There's positive and there's negative. So how do we store our, our emotional memories? So what it is, is imagine your, your unconscious mind is this long hallway. Right. And it's got all these different rooms on either side. And on this side of the hall, I got a room that says happy. The next to that, I got a room that says grateful. Next to that, I got a room that says love. So every single time I feel this emotion that we call happy from the first time I felt it as a baby to that first sip of coffee this morning. What the unconscious mind says, hmm, these feel the same. And they take those happy memories. They go into the happy room. Every time we feel grateful, it goes in the gratitude room. Every time we feel love, it goes in the love room. But here's the thing. All emotions act the same. So on this side of the hall, I got a room that says angry. Then I got a room next to that that says fear. Then I got a room next to that that says guilt. So every time I feel this emotion we call, we can agree on, we call anger. From the first time someone took my toy away to the jerk who cut me off on 35 the other day. Mm -hmm. The unconscious mind says, these feel the same. And those Angry memories going to angry room, fear memories going to fear room, the guilt memories going to guilt room. The significance of these rooms, whichever room has the most stuff in it, creates what I call an emotional filter through which you see your world. Okay. So when that filter acts like this window, and I know you can't see the window right now, but I'm looking out the window and I can see the blue sky, I see the trees, see the leaves, I can see the trunk, the grass. You know what I can't see? The, the glass. Window. The yeah. window itself. And that's how your emotion, remember, it's in the unconscious. So you are unconscious as a filter. And you think you're seeing that tree clearly, but it's through the filter of your emotions. And so that's whichever room has the, the most stuff is going to be the dominant filter through which you see your world. It's going to be the dominant emotion you feel in your every regular, in your regular every day. Mm. It's based on what's in those rooms. So the thing is, you want your filters to be on the positive side of the hall. I want to feel grateful. I want to feel happy. I want to feel love for what I see. And I want to receive love back from the world. And I will, so I want those to be the filters through which I interpret my world. But what happens when your fear room looks like one of those A&E hoarder shows with some 600 pound woman in the back, God forbid there's a fire because how are we yep. going to get her out of here? And that's how some people's fear, their anger room, their guilt room is. And so everything they see in their world, everything they see is filtered through that fear. Everything they hear, every post they read on social media is filtered through that fear. And they see it as a reason to be defensive. They see it as a reason to worry. And to me, the thing is, it ain't any of that because you're giving it meaning. You're the one telling the story as to what it means. So I'll tell you this, and you know, I don't really like to get ex extreme, but I'm going to give you one extreme. I cannot stand when people say social media is hurting our children. It is not. The choices we're making as to how we use it. Sure. And those choices are made by that person. Right. And that person is learning from who? From their parents. So unless you start to teach them how to control this, then they're going to be open to everyone else's opinions, everyone else's incentives for them to follow them. Be simply because as a parent, we didn't take control. And so like, you know, like this, the, that movie out there, um, the social experiment, something on Netflix where they talk about that. It's like, that's one thing I don't remember. They might've said it in the movie, so don't quote me, but <laughs> to me, they keep talking about the effect of 
the notifications and whatever. And I remember in the movie, one girl smashed her phone and left the dinner table and all that. Who's in control of the notifications on your phone? You are. Absolutely. So unless you take control, shut up. Okay. Unless so you stop it. I don't want to hear it. Stop. Let's go into the order room with me. So, so you and I, uh, as, as people who are, are one of our major passions in your profession is, is to help people get out of their own way. Yep. And really truly live the life. I, well, you and I are in that hoarder room. How do we empty the stuff in the hoarder room to make it so that I can fill it maybe with some of the other rooms or at least take that burden of thinking off? Okay. Well, that's the big thing. The method that I use is an NLP approach called mental and emotional release, where essentially, you know, without getting too scientific and boring you to death, <laughs> essentially what I do is make you aware, make you conscious of what's been unconscious. Okay. And so essentially the thing about the unconscious mind or your subconscious mind, it's your best friend. It's what keeps your heart beating. It's what keeps you breathing when you sleep. It's what keeps your eyes blinking. So your unconscious mind has your best interest in mind. And most people are out of rapport with themselves. Oh, they're out of rapport with the, with their unconscious mind. Think about your conscious mind, like a four year old version of you. Mm -hmm. Little dude, but old enough to understand some things and communicate and old enough to, to have a dog. So think of that unconscious mind or that subconscious mind as your dog. But you're four years old and the dog is a 175 pound Great Dane. Mm. It's your dog. It will never hurt you. Dog is man's best friend. So it's a big, strong dog, but it's like Scooby-Doo or Marmaduke. Never hurts you. But you realize as big as this dog is, if you don't understand his communication or you're not communicating effectively with him, although you have the leash, this dog will drag you all over town simply oh. because you're out of rapport. And so that goes back to the negative emotions. How do we collect? How do we get those rooms full? How did that fear room get full like that? Yeah. So every single time in your entire life, there's something happened that felt negative had a negative emotion to it. You felt bad. You got made fun of. So it's like, okay, I got picked last for dodgeball. You collect what I like to call a black bag mm -hmm. and you put it in that fear room. And then a couple years, different things happen day to day. Your cat, your goldfish died. You didn't get asked out to the middle school dance. Mm -hmm. You didn't make varsity baseball. And you just collect these things, collect these things, and you're just stuffing them in these rooms. And you think, oh, it's over because it's not happening now, but it's still in there because you didn't know how to let it, because you didn't know you were holding it, so you didn't know, it, so you never thought, how would I let this go? But what happens is we collect so many of these over time that all of a sudden, Matt, this turns into this. Mm -hmm. and people, how many people do we know walking around like, Matt, look what happened to me. Yes. Look, you don't, you, this is so heavy. You're not even helping me. Yeah. I got to carry this. This is heavy. And you're looking at me like, just put it down. And I'm like, but this is who I am. This is my story, man. Shut up. Put that down. That story is what's holding you back. That's where you're in your way. Yeah. So it's like, how do I clean out the rooms with, uh, with the basic instructions method? It's a combination of different integrative psychology techniques, mainly NLP in which we're able to clear those rooms out. It's a process, it doesn't take long. Like another another myth, people say, oh, change takes a long time. I will I will show you 20 of my clients that'll, that'll give you proof that that's not true. Mm -hmm. But you can change like that if you, dis if number one, you decide that whatever you're dealing with is un unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And number two, you learn how to communicate with the dog. Mm. That, it's that simple, not to go through the whole thing, we don't have enough time. But those are the general, those are the general principles is number one, you're in charge. You, your conscious mind, that's the four year old you, you have the leash, you're in charge. And then the dog sees a squirrel. If you don't know how to get him to heal, you're going for a ride. Yeah. yeah. And so that, that's really what it comes down to is, you know, so sometimes one client called me Caesar Milan because I know how to talk to the dog. And it's like, no, I'm teaching you so you can command the dog. Yep. And then you can, and then that whole time, the dog is in charge of those emotions. He's the one who's collecting all these black bags and putting them in there. So, but you got to learn how to teach him to leave those sticks outside. 
you know, there's a, I'm going to date myself here, or age myself here. There, there was a band that I was really into and actually still love listening to called Rage Against the Machine. And one of the lyrics in one of the Rage songs is anger is a gift. And I remember hearing that for the first time, Chucky. And I just thought to myself, anger is a gift. Absolutely. Because ascribing an, an emotional aspect or a good or bad sort of black and white aspect of this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Is NLP in your technique, is it that clear cut, black and white, yes, no, right, wrong? Or are you able to help people in the gray area to still get the outcomes that they desire? It's funny. You gave me two options. It's like a multiple <laughs> choice here. But to me, neither one of them are right. Good. Because Good. The, thing, the thing is, right and wrong are not truths. They're judgments by the individual. Mm. You're judging by the individual. I can't tell somebody what's right for them, but I can help them determine based on what they want to achieve or what their experience is that they no longer want to experience. Then it's easy to guide them to make the decisions that, that are most important for them so that they experience things the way they want to. So you, so, so let's say that, that how were you able to utilize negative emotions or emotions that people would ascribe or subscribe to a specific feeling in order for you to push through stuff that's happened in your life? The, the biggest thing is we got to stop saying push through. If you're trying to push through, then you're oh. doing it wrong. You're doing oh. it wrong. So here's the thing. We got to get rid of basic instruction. Number one is let go of the past, let go of these, let go okay. of any beliefs that may be in the way of you experiencing what you want now, that belief probably was valuable to you in the past, but now it seems to be in the way. And so, but because we've been running the same script for so long, we keep trying to push through with our beliefs intact. No, what if that period of time where that belief, like I'll give you, I'll give you a specific example of a client I had a couple years ago. She's about 45 years old and she had never been married, but she wanted to get married, have children, and she's running out of time. I could totally appreciate that. What was really fascinating to me is as I listened to her story, her language, and she said, you know, I just don't want to be alone. I, I, I'm, I'm tired of being single. I feel like I'm lacking. What are the dogs just here? Alone, single, and lacking. Yeah, and that's what you gave them a set for, and your unconscious behavior is going to make sure you stay alone. But and she doesn't realize that she's the one commanding the dog. The dog is a dog. He doesn't understand the word don't. Whatever picture you show him of you being alone and lacking and single, he's going to think that's what you want, especially because you put emotion behind the thought. So now the dog really believes what you want. And so all of a sudden, you're going to continue to see that in your world. It's going to keep showing up reasons why you're single people who, which unconsciously is going to make me be attracted to people who ultimately will probably reject me to keep my story intact. I need to get rejected in order to keep my belief alive. And so you do things that are set. That, that's a self-sabotage people talk yeah, about. Totally. And so the biggest thing is understanding that emotions, there's no such thing as good or bad. You, to me, most people see things in black and white, literally and figuratively. But the thing is why, okay. If my, if the dog's my best friend, if my unconscious, my best friend, why would he hold on to these negative emotions? Why would he make me feel this? There's a reason. See, the, the, the reason why nature gave us negative emotions is for when we lived amongst the other wildlife on this planet. How many hundreds, thousands of years ago when we're living in the grasslands and the mountains and the jungles and the forests on the plains, we're dealing with coyotes and tigers and snakes and all this stuff. The reason why negative emotions are there is to keep you alive. Yeah. So just imagine if I'm if I'm living in, in the forest and I'm woke up early to go hunt for my family. Right pretty relaxed. It's a nice day. So I'm walking through the jungle and, you know, just thinking about how beautiful my wife was when she was still sleeping this morning. Something funny my daughter said the other day, and I'm just, you know, really relaxed and chilling. So I go to a creek, I go to get a drink of water and I'm drinking water. And all of a sudden in my peripheral, there's a tiger. Mm. That's when the fear kicks in because that fight or flight response is going to save your life in that situation. The problem today in 2021 is fear acts the same. And so a lot of times people need to project it at something outside of themselves, like the pirates they lost. Anytime I'm feeling something negative, I project it out because that's the way negative emotions are designed is so that I see that tiger, I get afraid, and then I can take action to save my life. 
But now instead of being afraid of a tiger, when that fear kicks in, all of a sudden, I'm afraid of what you think of me. And that's the problem is people don't understand those negative emotions. Negative emotions is the dog telling you, hey, pay attention. Mm. That's all it is. Anything more to it is a story you you put on it. All it means is, hey, pay attention. So let's say you're dealing with somebody you're having a problem with in your office, coworker, employee, employer, and you're having this, this difficult problem and they irritate you. Mm-hmm. They make you angry. That's the dog saying, hey, you need to set a boundary. But no, you say no. You're telling the dog, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Because like my dog, he barks at anything that goes by. The other dog walks by, he's barking. The wind blows, he's barking. For no reason, he's barking. And so you find yourself telling that dog, shh, I don't want to hear that. But if you tell him to shut up all the time, what's he supposed to do when there's a burglar crawling in the window? Yeah. How will you pay attention if he doesn't tell you to pay attention? So you, the thing is, all that means when the anger, the sadness, the fear, the hurt, the guilt comes up, it's yourself that you're out of rapport with telling you, hey, you need to make a change. But you know everything. So you just can't. No, nope, I'm just going to ignore it. I'm just going to stuff it down. I'm going to stuff it in one of these rooms in the unconscious. And what happens is that you're, all this sensory information you take in comes in through your nerves that run through your whole body. And then it's compiled up here so you realize that that baggage isn't just an idea it's in your body it's Mm -hmm. in your nerves and when you have a child you pass that on to the child unless you do something about it in this lifetime and that's where most people they don't know what they don't know yeah but the thing is if you knew then you that gives you the ability to make different decisions more empowering decisions so that life feels the way you want it to when something negative comes up that's your your indication to pause Stay, take a step back and pay attention. What can I change to prevent this from, from this feeling coming back? But no one ever looks at themselves. It's everyone else's fault. You know, my grandmother said, Chuck, I'm sure every, so many grandmothers said this. My grandmother was not, you know, uh, anything I'm sure. But, but when she said, you know, when you point a finger, you've got three fingers pointing back at you. So you're three times more responsible than the person that you're pointing your finger at. And with that, what should I have asked you? I mean, we we covered, I think we covered a lot of territory here, but I'm afraid that I didn't ask you the one question or have you clarify one point that would tie this stuff up and make people really realize that they can be in control of their own destiny. Well, I don't know. I don't know if you could ask this question, but I can answer it now. Okay, go. Is essentially understanding the the principle of that filter. When you hear that negative story in your mind, or what I like to call limiting beliefs, greatest hits, it's like a jukebox in your mind or those tapes, you know, it's limiting beliefs, greatest hits. And we all know these songs. We know the lyrics as soon as they come on because it's spinning around like a vinyl record again and again, obsessing, obsessing. And then the song starts like, I can't, Mm -hmm. I'm not, I, I just don't want. If that's the regular story going on in your mind, that's only sounds like that because it's coming through the filter. Gotcha. So think about the little kid and the dog. The little kid's in charge. He's got the leash. Or an NLP, there's a saying, the conscious mind is the goal setter. The conscious mind sets the goals. It's the one that, that's directing the crew, the, the dog, as to where it's supposed to go. The unconscious mind is the goal getter. So whatever's going to get you there is your unconscious programming. Not what you think you know, that's only 10%. Like you've heard people say, you only use 10% of our minds. No, the conscious mind is only 10%. Which means, like Dr. Bruce Lipton says, we're living about 90 to 90 percent of our 95 percent of our lives from that unconscious standpoint, unconscious programming. And so you're inadvertently making mistakes all the time that are leading to your lack of results. And so it's a matter of, first of all, looking at your results in business, in life, your family and say, am I okay with this? Hmm. That's the first until you decide it's unacceptable. Nobody can help you. There's no wizard. So, again, it's just recognizing that. Those emotions are what's causing the negative self-talk or what's causing the limiting beliefs of I can't and I'm not. So, again, think about it like this. The little kid, the four-year-old version of you, he's in charge. He gets to tell any story he wants. Would the conscious four-year-old, the little human, make up a story about himself, which kids do all the time? Yeah. Would he make up a story about himself in which, in the end, he's the loser? Would he consciously do that? 
So yeah. that's when you know it's the dog. That's right. If if the story pops into your head that doesn't feel good, don't believe it. No. It's not. It's not the. It's not you. It's the emotion. Otherwise, it wouldn't sound like that. You wouldn't choose this. So that's a simpler way to look at it. When you hear that negative self-talk, I can't, I'm not, I don't want, and it feels negative, the question you need to ask yourself is, would I consciously choose this? If you wouldn't choose it, then it's the dog, period. And so all that negative self-talk, I'm just anxious, I'm just this. Those are stories that you need to stop. Because that's why your life sucks. That's why you can't get your results. It's because of you. Because you keep commanding the dog, I can't, I'm not, I don't want. And that's all he's showing you. It's things that you can't do and things you, that you don't want. If it's a negative story, don't believe it. All right. Choose your story. Choose your story. There's a lot I want to sum up here. But before I do that. Chucky, thanks, man. This was fun. I love it. Yeah, I love I, you. I love going back and forth on this stuff. You're the freaking expert. And I learned all sorts of wonderful things today. And here's one of the big things that I want everybody to just hear said once again. Number one, change or die. Mm-hmm. Right? Number two, let go of the past. Number three, you create your own f- future. Number four, and this is the, this is the one that really like got me, like I got choked up when you said this, was get back in rapport with yourself. Holy crap, is that a powerful yeah. statement? Like, yeah, how many of you realize how out of rapport you are with your own self? And this is all you got. We're on this thing for a short period of time. Man, get back in touch with yourself. Figure out what those baggies are that he was talking about. Stop holding on to that damn backpack that you're holding on to with dear life. Because that is what's stopping you from rising above the noise and being your loud and truly being who you could be. This is a gift. This planet is a di- gift. This day is a gift. And so many of you are holding so tightly onto that bag that you're not allowing yourself to appreciate the gift. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, Chucky, if somebody wants to reach out to you to find out a little bit more how they can learn how to get back and rapport with themselves and truly ask themselves the tough question, which is, would you consciously choose this? What is the best way for them to reach out to you? Basicinstructions.com. That's plural because there are four basic instructions or the place where we all tend to congregate in this professional space is LinkedIn. So as far as social media, LinkedIn is definitely the best way. And my name's pretty unique. So it's not like you're going to find a million listings there. So LinkedIn is, is a big way. And essentially it's just looking at whatever area we all got like six areas of life that we're dealing with. And you have your career, you have your physical health, you have your spirituality, you know, whatever your faith might be your relationships, that's whoever you're sleeping with, your family, your friends. And it's like, we're just juggling these balls, trying to keep life in a rhythm. What most people don't realize is that these balls are all made out of different materials. See, some of them are rubber, some of them are glass. Mm. So when you think about this career one, the career ball, that one is rubber. So if I drop it, it'll bounce back intact. Now, if I drop it, It's going to throw the rhythm off for a little bit, but I can get that ball back and regain the rhythm. But your, your self, your self esteem, your, your relationship with your higher power, your family, your spouse, all those balls are made of glass. Yeah. So as I'm juggling, if I drop one of those, it's going to be scuffed, cracked. It might even be shattered either way. It's never going to be the same again. So it's about understanding what, how do I keep this rhythm going? How do I decide what's what's the most important? What are the priorities as it pertains to that? And a lot of time, a lot of people say, I can't, I can't visualize, I can't think, I can't, I can't, I can't. Well, as long as you keep saying that, the dog will make sure you can. All right, everybody, if you have not subscribed to our podcast or the live stream, please make sure that you do. We come out with these just about every single solitary Monday at noon Eastern time. And think about everything that Chucky said. Go back and listen to this one more time because there's so much here. And the more you listen to somebody tell you these things that you truly need to hear, the more real they're going to become to you. And hopefully the more uh, interested you're going to be in once again, creating rapport with yourself. So for Chucky and all of us here at Proudmouth is Matt Halloran. We'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. 
Thank you for listening to Be Your Own Loud, where we reverse engineer success to help you accelerate your influence and break free from the torment of sales. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to our podcast, share with others in your company or profession, follow us on social media. This podcast is brought to you by Proudmouth, the Influence Accelerators. Visit us at Proudmouth.com and join our Influence Accelerator Academy for free to enhance your marketing mindset and know-how.